an answer I got in the early days was, look, there cannot be a science of consciousness. Why? Well, on your own account, science uh, is uh, objective and consciousness is subjective. So it follows immediately there cannot be a science of consciousness. Now, I love that argument because it's a classic fallacy. It, uh, there's even got a name. It's called a fallacy of ambiguity. The word subjective is being used in two different senses. There's a difference between the ontological sense of the objective-subjective distinction and the epistemic sense. Ep epistemic objectivity and subjectivity are properties of statements, properties of claims. So, I, to take my favorite example, if I say Rembrandt was born in 1606, that's objective. We can settle that as a matter of fact whether or not Rembrandt was born in 1606. I think he was, but I could be wrong. That's an objective matter of fact. That's epistemic objectivity. Now, if I say Rembrandt was a better painter than Rubens, which I think he was, that, as they say, is a matter of subjective opinion. Uh, that's not something you can settle as a matter of fact. Now, there are a lot of interesting questions about aesthetics. I think it is a matter of fact uh, that Rembrandt's paintings are better than uh, Bugs Bunny, uh, but I, and I could uh, demonstrate that to you given enough time, all right? I'm not going to do it this morning. But epistemic objectivity and subjectivity is the distinction between those statements that are settleable as matters of fact, they're matters of objective truth, and those that are matters of subjective opinion. That's the epistemic sense. But now there's an also an ontological sense of the objective-subjective distinction, and that has to do with the modes of existence. Mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates have an ontologically objective mode of existence. What does that mean? That means that they exist apart from anybody's experiences. But pains and tickles and itches and, and anxiety and depression and elation, those have an ontologically subjective mode of existence. What does that mean? It means they only exist insofar as they are experienced by a human or animal subject. Okay, now here's the point of emphasizing this. When we say science is objective, what we mean is it is epistemically objective. Scientists seek truths that are independent of the feelings and attitudes of particular investigators. Science strives for epistemic objectivity. But, and this is the bottom line of this whole discussion, the ontological subjectivity of a domain does not prevent us from having epistemically objective truths about the elements in that domain. I'm sorry that sentence sounded a bit pompous, so let me give it to you in simpler terms. Uh, the fact that you're investigating something touchy and feely like pains and depression, uh, and those are ontologically subjective, that doesn't mean that you cannot have an objective science. You can have an objective science of a phenomena that are ontologically subjective. And in fact, I, as I, I'm, again, I mentioned this before, but I want to emphasize it. <clears throat> Philosophers often talk about, well, you couldn't have a science of consciousness. Oh, really? Why not? Go to any medical bookstore. Go to any, or in this, uh, we, we don't have a medical school, we have a big pre-med uh, thing. I go to the pre-med uh, uh, branch of the, live, of the bookstores and look up textbooks uh, on neurology. I look up the textbooks on, that are designed for doctors who actually have to deal with patients who are suffering, and they will tell you Object, epistemically objective truths about pain, even though pain is ontologically subjective. So to repeat the, the pompous claim, because it's important, the ontological subjectivity of a domain, like consciousness, does not prevent us from having an epistemically objective science of that domain. And in fact, again, I like uh, neurology because these poor doctors have to deal with patients that are actually suffering. And the doctor can't say, well, I can't help you because your, your suffering is subjective and I'm a scientist. I mean, that's, that's cheating. You know, you've got to treat this guy. He's suffering. Now, it's true. A lot of the stuff they use is... <coughs> 
is, as they say, empirical, meaning they haven't the faintest idea how the hell it works, but it works. I mean, they found out that it works. I, I so uh, people take this sodium compound, sodium acetyl salicylate, and it, it uh, it's called aspirin, and it makes their headache less. And I don't think to this day we know exactly how aspirin works. A good uh, assignment for somebody to look it up on Google and see if we know. But last time I looked, we didn't know how it works. So yeah, a lot of it is is um, uh, um, matters of just finding correlations. You get certain uh, things that work and certain things that don't work. And I, I, whenever I go to these doctors and they say, and I, they give me some painkiller and I want to know how does it work? Is it going to cut down the amount of serotonin or does it accurate, operate on other neurotransmitters? Mostly these doctors look nervous as hell when I ask them. They don't know from serotonin. They just know you're supposed to uh, prescribe such and such a, a medicine for such and such kind of pain.